So, good evening to all of you. I would uh, want to extend a warm welcome to you on behalf of the IWM, the Institute for Human Sciences. However quite warm it already is, so for today I'd rather extend a cordial welcome to all of you. My name is Ludger Hagedorn, my very German name you find uh, also written here, so I will not repeat it. Uh, I'm a permanent fellow here at the Institute. Welcome to our monthly lecture uh, at the IWM. We are very happy today uh, to have Jan Prakas as a speaker of tonight. Jan Prakas is a historian of modern India, a professor of history at Princeton University, and currently our visiting fellow at uh, the IWM just for the month of June. It's a bit short, Jan, but I hope you enjoy it anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, we are very happy to have you here for, for, for this lecture of tonight. And I will only give uh, two more sh very short comments at the beginning and then uh, immediately hand over to you, Jan, for uh, the talk that you will give and the discussion with Dilip will follow afterwards. Two short remarks. Um, uh, Jan will start his lecture tonight uh, um, with the new humanism of Franz Fanon. Just as a little reminder and to build a bit on the continuity of uh, what fellows are doing here at the Institute, I'm, uh, I would want to, to remind some of us that uh, last October we had another fellow visiting uh, the IWM, uh, Adam Schatz, uh, the US editor of the London Review of Books, and he actually during the time of his stay here at the IWM was working on a book on Franz Fanon. Uh, his project was entitled The Work, Life and Afterlives of Franz Fanon. And I just checked uh, this afternoon uh, because of your uh, lecture coming up, Jan. The book is meant to come out very early. It says January on the website. Uh, um, this biography of Franz Fanon, The Rebel's Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon, entitled with uh, Mac Millen. I think this is a nice uh, continuity of... Uh, talks happening here at the IWM. Second short remark, uh, I'm very grateful for Dilip Gonka that you have volunteered to moderate uh, the talk of tonight. Though you only arrived a few days ago, you immediately took over the responsibility of being uh, like the second host and the moderator of tonight. This is very great of you. Thank you so much, Dilip. Dilip Gonka is a professor in rhetoric and public culture and the director of the Center for Global Culture and Com Communication of Northwestern University. And I may add a very old friend of the Institute. We are very happy to have you here again. And let me also say that you have another opportunity to see and listen to Dilip tomorrow. And not only to, uh, to Dilip, we will have a big event tomorrow. Please have a look at our website if you have not already seen it. Degenerations and Regenerations of Democracy. And also, I might add something that is also in continuity with the talk of tonight, also with a big uh, focus on questions of democracy in India. This will be the talk of uh, tomorrow. Very last point, let me already invite you for a little uh, uh, reception that we will have uh, downstairs after uh, uh, the, our discussion. Welcome for that. Join us for a glass of wine. Thank you. I wish you all a nice evening. Jan, the floor is... Uh, first, thank you to IWM for inviting me as a visiting fellow and uh, for arranging this talk. And thank you all for coming. I, the little time that I've been here, I realize how precious our time over here is. So for sacrificing your time to come here, uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> so uh, the lecture is part of a project that uh, began as a study of culture under the Cold War. But as I looked at the records, it, one thing became clear, that when seen from North America or Europe, the world after 1945 appeared as an era of the Cold War. But look from elsewhere, particularly from the ex-colonies, the world seemed to be an era of decolonization and struggle for post-colonial futures. 
the idea of the third world emerged out of that urge for the world after empire. Historiography, however, has made third world into uh, a geopolitical concept. Um, it's robbed it of its uh, imaginative ambition uh, to be something more than a geographical descriptor. I mean, in common language, often people say these days, it's become sort of common sense, oh, this is like third world. Uh, and that's to refer to a particular place of underdevelopment, poverty, and so on. So I went back to Fanon. Uh, and for him, the idea of the third world was not merely about political sovereignty, but something much more ambitious, the creation of a different world, the world after empire. It wasn't about development. So towards the end of the Wretched of the Earth, he says, uh, comrades, let's forget Europe. It's not a question of catching up. Look at America, which has uh, imitated, and look what's happened to America. So for him, uh, the world after empire was tied to what he called a new humanism, the created creation of a new humanity, virtually Im uh, imagination of a new life. Uh, so the world after empire was not about just politics, it was really about creation of a new form of life. Underlying this vision was, of course, a question of culture. This was because anti-colonial intellectuals long understood that colonialism was not only about military conquest and physical occupation, uh, but also about cultural domination. Fanon argued that a new national culture could be the basis of a post-colonial future. His vision of national culture was dynamic. It did not mean a recovery and revival of the past, but something created by politics, by anti-colonial struggle. Politics was to produce a new national culture. And he insisted that this national culture is something that must be composed and cultivated by political struggle on the ground. So consider, for example, his skepticism about negritude. Uh, he thought negritude, uh, he could understand why there was a demand for uh, negritude, but he thought its culturalist project uh, did not address the question of politics and political struggle. So this dynamic and political struggle-based uh, national culture, Fanon believed, could be the basis for international solidarity. So in the closing pages of uh, his chapter on national culture, he writes, National consciousness, which is not nationalism, is alone capable of giving us an international dimension. There are two points to note in his statement that is of contemporary relevance. First, it was a vision of globalism based on political struggle and political solidarity. Second, uh, so, and it was not about globalism based on market-based globalization. So it distinguishes his version of globalism very much from the globalization that we know today. Second, his distinction between national culture and nationalism um, refers to something that we see a lot today, which is the ascent of nationalism or the becoming of national culture into nationalism. There are many examples of this. Um, and and uh, you will you know, fill in the blanks of you know, uh, different nationalist culture. But I'm going to refer 
particularly to Hindu right-wing Hindu nationalism in India, which is exclusionary uh, and narrow-minded. So the question is, what happened? How is it that national culture became nationalism? To address this, I want to go back to the immediate period. Uh, higher? Oh, where is the... Oh, the other way. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So this is the first slide. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the um, early period of decolonization. Um, like Fanon, many of the Indian uh, anti-colonial leaders also thought that decolonization could be the basis for a new social and political order and an internationalism that would be different from the inequality of imperial globalism. They valued youth and newness. So, for example, Gandhi, for all his uh, pride in traditional civilization of India, it's interesting that he called his journal Young India. His press was called Navjeevan Press, which means New Life Press. Um, <clears throat> the leader of uh, Dalits, or formerly called Untouchables, Ambedkar, uh, called his religion or his interpretation of Buddhism um, as a religion of democracy uh, as Navayana, which means a new vehicle. Jawaharlal Nehru called his sort of classic nationalist text the discovery of India. For him, as for all uh, anti-colonial activists, the nation was not something narrow, but part of something cosmopolitan, modern, and international. So opening the uh, Asian Relations Conference in New Delhi in March 1947, he said, quote, we stand at the end of an era and threshold of a new period of history. Now, Nehru planned no over -re revolutionary overthrow of the colonial order, but the soaring rhetoric of this new period of history expressed yearning for radical new beginnings. So one thing that I notice a lot in the writings of actually not just Indian anti-colonial leaders, but if you look at anti-colonial leaders across the world, in Africa, uh, for example, in Asia, Sukarno, in all of them there is this kind of urge for newness and the idea of looking for something beyond the existing society. So as I started working on this sort of project to build uh, a new modern national culture, my research led me to theater. Now, it's a field completely new to me. I've never worked on theater before. Uh, and, you know, learning about it is like learning a new language. Uh, you have to learn new bibliography, new scholars, new authorities, uh, and so on. Uh, but anyways, th that's what I've uh, done. So as I studied the history of uh, modern Indian theater, uh, it became clear that someone like Nehru had uh, a statist sort of cult cultural project. On the ground, however, there were strivings to build a new radical national culture based on anti-imperialism and social equality. 
An expression of this long longing was an organization called Indian People's Theater Association. It's called IPTA, I-B-T-A, uh, which was formed in Mumbai in 1943. This is the uh, uh, cover of a magazine that it published. IPTA was uh, a communist-dominated uh, organization, but it was more than just a front organization. It brought together leading Indian cultural practitioners in art, music, dance, poetry, and theater. And it resembled the... Paris-based International Association of Writers for the Defense of Culture Against Fascism, the little uh, theater groups in Britain, and the Federal Theater Project in, in the United States. IPTA anticipated the Fanonian spirit of building a national culture as part of political struggle against imperialism and capitalism. And it offered the first serious critique by Indian artists of colonial capitalism and envisioned a radical theater of the people. It rejected 19th century colonial theater and sharply criticized what it called the false modernity uh, of so-called realist plays yearning for love in romance, uh, in romantic drama, and recourse to a distant past, which was very common in nationalism, what, sort of looking back to the past and reviving the past as a kind of a model for the future. IPTA, on the other hand, argued that art and literature could have a future only if they became authentic expressions of people's struggle for freedom and culture. IPTA had two major goals. First, to develop forms outside the naturalistic and commercial alternatives to advance uh, a form of culture that would struggle against imperialism, capitalism, and fascism. Second, it was to draw on India's rich cultural heritage and folk forms to create an alternative to what it called bourgeois urban uh, colonial theater. These two goals were to serve in building a genuine national tradition. So over the decade uh, after 1943 or so, it produced um, hundreds of plays. Uh, uh, one was a play called Nabapanna in 1944, which was about this devastating Bengal famine in 1943, which killed about 3 million people. Uh, and this play was about the famine, and it interpreted the famine as a result of feudal exploitation, uh, colonialism, uh, and you know, represented kind of peasant struggle against feudalism. It toured extensively across India uh, in urban locations and in rural locations, uh, trying to you know, mobilize this kind of... Uh, uh, radical culture. IPTA performed several social realist uh, plays highlighting class exploitation, the slaughter of the partition of British India in 1947, and people's struggles. It produced anti-fascist plays and Western plays in translation, including uh, Mulkraj Anand's adaptation of Clifford Odette's, Odette's uh, Waiting for the Lefty. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> Mulkraj Anand. He was not uh, a member of the core group of IPTA, but he was part of a wider circle of uh, progressive writers in the cultural movement. He obtained his uh, doctorate in philosophy from Cambridge in 1929, uh, and then he joined, kind of left his students um, uh, in London, uh, and he wrote two really acclaimed social realist uh, novels in 1935 and 19, 1936. One was called The Untouchable, the other called The Coolie. And he was part of the literary 
Bloomsbury Circle in London with people like Forster and so on. In 1935, he attended the Paris Symposium of the International Writers' Congress for the Defense of Culture Against Fascism, which was organized by André Gide, uh, Henri Babousset, and uh, André Malraux. And following the conference, Anand and his colleagues established Progressive Writers' Association in London, uh, which later on be, uh, moved to India and held its inaugural conference in India in 1936 and became a very powerful um, organization. Anand himself returned to uh, India in 1946, and in Mumbai he started a journal called MARG, uh, M-A-R-G, which in Sanskrit, it's drawn from Sanskrit, which means pathway, but M-A-R-G also was an acronym for Modern Artist Research Group. Uh, and he was very involved in kind of discussions on um, art and architecture. And he went on to become a major figure in sort of um, Indian, uh, Indian culture. And he collaborated on the one hand uh, with people like uh, Le Corbusier in his discussion on uh, modern architecture. And on the other hand, he participated in uh, conferences like Afro-Asian Writers Conference and World Peace Council. So here he is with this very important uh, artist group in uh, Bombay in 1946-47, Progressive Artist Group. Many of them who went on to become now, and they are, you know, celebrated, their paintings are celebrated, like people like Hussein, Souza, and so on. They sell for millions of dollars. Uh, but he, uh, Anand was, uh, you know, working with people like uh, Progressive Writers uh, Group uh, and at the same time collaborating with people like uh, Corbusier. Yeah. Uh, this is with uh, Corbusier in his uh, studio in Paris. <coughs> the members of uh, IPTA, like uh, Anand, and Progressive Writers Association, they overlapped uh, as they were part of this kind of a literary and cultural avant-garde um, in India in the 40s and the 50s. And the two organizations were in the forefront of th thinking seriously about uh, a post-colonial national culture. Uh, and the 40s and 50s were the kind of heydays of their uh, impressive productions and their popularity. Uh, you know, I saw this picture. Uh, I actually discovered it very recently. And this was following a, a conference of IPTA in 1947. We can see there were hundreds of thousands of people who participated in uh, these cultural conferences and then participated in kind of a big demonstrations. Um, so, it was an attempt to build uh, on the ground a powerful cultural movement uh, that had ties to trade union movement and peasant movement. There was a kind of vision of uh, a connection with the working class and the peasantry. In in. Bombay in particular, in the mill districts on, in Bombay in particular, uh, the work of IPTA also produced, um, you know, people you would call um, in Antonio Gramsci's terms sort of um, organic intellectuals, that people from the working class who became um, artists themselves, who wrote plays and used various kinds of uh, folk forms to talk about class and capitalism and, and so on. So the 40s and 50s was really the kind of heyday of IPTA. Uh, but it declined by the mid-50s. And there are many reasons uh, why it declined. Um, one was that its combative stance against the Nehru government brought state repression. Many of these... 
uh, artists had to go underground. Um, second, um, India's independence had also created a kind of a cultural confusion among many of these artists. On the one hand, you know, the Communist Party and leftists had called the independence a kind of false independence. Um, and so many of the artists didn't buy into that interpretation. So there was some kind of confusion. And third, many of the artists also resisted against uh, political propaganda that masqueraded as art. So very didactic kind of you know, art. Um, you know, people kind of resisted that. In any case, I think by and large, uh, if one were to characterize the work of IPTA and Progressive Writers Association in general, one could say that the object of building a real kind of people's culture remained unfulfilled. Because in many cases, what you had were urban intellectuals, uh, middle class urban intellectuals, going to poor areas and uh, depicting before them uh, working class culture. It was like telling the working class how to be the working class. And, but of course, this was being told by middle class intellectuals. Um, so it would incorporate f you know, folk forms to, sh to show the folk how to be folk. You know. So it was very didactic, and it, it really didn't create the kind of form of culture that it wanted. But another very important reason for its decline was that the state itself entered the cultural arena to promote what it called national culture. And Nehru himself, as the first prime minister, was committed to this idea of national culture. And he considered it vital for uh, national unity. And one can understand this sort of concern for national unity in the period around 46, 47. There's, of course, the turmoil of the, uh, the post-war atmosphere. There's the turmoil of the partition of British India, which created, you know, killed 2 million people, and about 14 million people were displaced. Um, there were insurgencies in different parts of India. And so many of the um, national leaders felt that the situation was reminiscent of the state of nature sort of described in uh, Hobbes' uh, um, Leviathan, you know. So if there was this kind of anarchy, uh, how could uh, unity be built. And that's where they saw the state as being extremely important. That the state would, you know, uh, rescue India out of this anarchy and build national unity. And to build this national unity, uh, national culture, they thought, was important. Particularly in a country like India with, you know, at least 16 different official languages. Um, different regions, um, how do you build kind of a national unity over here? And so they thought, well, culture was important. And so with this in mind, the state established two very important organizations. One was called Sangeet Natak Academy, SNA, which really means uh, Music and Drama Academy, or Academy for Music and Drama. Uh, and the other was Lalit Kala Academy. It's really an academy for the fine arts. And these two organizations were uh, set, set up in the 50s as part of this sort of project of national culture. Now, Sangeet Natak Academy, we will call SNA, it held a number of very important um, seminars in the 50s. Uh, so there was one seminar that was held in 1956, which in the kind of history of theater, you can see it, its importance. It was the f for the first time that it brought together theater professionals speaking different languages from different parts of India for the first time together to consider the 
question of theater. How does one think of theater in a country with kind of multiple languages and build something that is uh, national? The invitees to this uh, seminar included Mulk Rajanan uh, that we've met before. Um, and the object of the seminar was to relate this sort of complex legacy of uh, cultural heritage in, in, of India in art, music, uh, poetry, theater, dance, drama, to the needs of uh, a modern nation. How to develop uh, a kind of modern idiom for these traditional uh, uh, heritage of, of India. So the seminar participants agreed that you know, colonial theater was uh, no longer usable. When, interestingly, when IPTA was discussed, it was dismissed. Even Anand, who had been associated with IPTA, and he was participant in this seminar, even he dismissed it. Because for these theater professionals, the central question was how to develop an aesthetic form for the modern nation. And how would this aesthetic form use um, traditions that India had in inherited in, um, in different areas? So Anand, for example, uh, he believed that there was a basic uh, conflict between um, Indian traditions of art and Western forms, that Western forms emphasized rationalism whereas Indian forms were uh, largely symbolic, that they, uh, symbolism was very important in Indian traditions. And so how do you develop this kind of symbolic uh, kind of culture uh, for modern times? So the concern really became more about developing aesthetic forms uh, for modernity um, rather than, you know, the IPTA kind of uh, idea of uh, culture. So in the end, the, the seminar produced certain kinds of binaries which have kind of remained for a long time. Uh, binaries between Indian and Western, modern and traditional, rural and urban, professional and amateur, and so on. Uh, so the culture was then thought in these kinds of binary terms. It is in the context of these discussions that uh, uh, I'm going to talk about him later, but uh, the SNA uh, set up the National School of Drama um, in 1959, which went on to become a very important institution. Uh, and the object of National School of Drama was to aim, was to study, train, uh, and teach drama, but kind of national drama. And, and there was a lot of discussion about what is national uh, in a country where you have uh, different linguistic traditions. But NSD, the National School of Drama, was part of kind of Nehru's project to create uh, a national culture that drew on India's cultural heritage to build a modern national culture. And in 1962, uh, Ibrahim Alkazi was appointed as its director, a position that he occupied till 1977 for 15 years. Alkazi is a very interesting figure. Uh, he um, was born to Arab parents um, who had come to India. Uh, his father had come to India for his shipping business uh, in the 30s. And Alkazi was born in India, in Pune. And then he was educated in India. Uh, he later on then went to RADA, uh, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London, got trained there, then came back to Bombay. Now, 
you know, when I think of uh, Al Qazi, uh, who died very recently in 2019, uh, 2020 actually, uh, during uh, COVID, uh, the appointment of such a person would be unthinkable today. Imagine choosing a person who is of Arab heritage, who was born in India, to head the National School of Drama, to create the National School of Drama. Can you imagine? I mean, it would, you know, in Modi's India, it would be blasphemy to think of someone like him. But he's appointed as, uh, as the director. Uh, and he too was, you know, so Bombay in the 40s and 50s is really kind of a cultural hub. Um, I talked about progressive artist group earlier. So Al Qazi also worked with the progressive artist group. And in fact, many of those artists actually uh, painted posters for uh, his plays. And the plays that he staged in Bombay were largely kind of Western plays. Uh, they were things like uh, Macbeth, this is Al Qazi as Macbeth, uh, Medea, uh, okay, and then a number of other, like Julius Caesar, Antigone. And so mostly in Bombay, uh, he staged these Western plays. But he became known for his kind of professionalism and for his stagecraft. So when, NS, when he came uh, and uh, took over uh, the NST in 62, he established a kind of a curriculum for theater training, uh, which became a model for uh, being emulated elsewhere uh, in India. So underlying al Qazi's program was a conviction that you know, theater could not be taught without a knowledge of its significant traditions, both Indian and Western, um, Asian traditions, classical, modern, contemporary. Uh, so it was a very wide open uh, program of theater training. And in 1964, he set up uh, an NSD repertory, uh, which over the next 13 years produced, like, um, staged about 48 plays. Uh, most of which were directed by Al Qazi. Um, and these were, you know, celebrated productions of, uh, that are known in India called Andha Yug, Tughlaq, and so on, in Hindi, and then Hindi versions of uh, Euripides' uh, Trojan Women, Beckett's uh, Waiting for Godot, uh, Buchner's uh, Danton's Death, Moliere's School for Wives, and so on. Okay. Uh, now, Al Qazi himself was not uh, involved in kind of ideological debates about Indian versus Western, what is national, and so on. He was much more about kind of professionalizing theater. Um, and, you know, people who trained with him, you know, often sort of say uh, jokingly, you know, the director was also a dictator, um, that Al Qazi had very clear ideas about, you know, what is theater and how to train, train you, uh, had very little uh, patience for acting, but you know, really focused much more on stagecraft and visuality and so on. Uh, and he strove to expand audiences uh, for NSD. And for this, he staged um, plays in Delhi's... Um, archaeological sites. Uh, so this was, for example, uh, um, staged in old fort uh, in Delhi, which is a 16th century old ruins of a fort. Um, and it, it was kind of spectacular um, because it was a historical play and it used the location um, to suggest a certain kind of a sweep uh, of the play that he was staging. And so he was mastered this kind of a stagecraft in using uh, historical sites for this kind of open air productions. Uh, 
another one. Yeah, so this is another play called Tughlaq, which he staged again at this uh, uh, old fort. And these performances really excelled in kind of stagecraft, visuality, uh, and various other kind of technical aspects uh, of, of theater. Under him, NSD became uh, a theater uh, of experiments, exploring folk theater, uh, plays in Hindi languages, Asian tradition, uh, theatrical traditions. Uh, so this is, for example, a folk play that was set up. Uh, it was staged in 1968, uh, Just Mangudan, which was a play in Gujarati. Uh, it was written and directed by uh, Shanta Gandhi. She had been a member of IPTA earlier and then became a faculty at NSD. And so she directed this play. Uh, NSD was very importantly also invited um, or opened its door to Brecht. Uh, it invited Carl Weber, who had once been Brecht's uh, directing assistant, uh, to NSD, where he produced uh, the Caucasian chalk circle in Hindi in 1968. Um, it also invited uh, Fritz Benowitz, uh, who was um, a student of Brecht and was a director of uh, a theater at Weimar uh, in GDR. And he produced a uh, three penny opera in uh, 1970 uh, in Hindi. Uh, now, Alkazi believed that Brecht had a particular relevance uh, to India. This was not because of the content of. Uh, Brecht's plays or his politics, but rather their form. That Brecht had broken from the three-act uh, form and had used uh, narration, music, uh, dance, all of which then resonated with Indian theatrical traditions. And Alkazi was not the only one to note this uh, use of Brecht and India. There were others. There was another uh, <clears throat> theater director called Habib Tanvir uh, in Hindi uh, who had become an enthusiast of uh, Brecht by seeing his plays in Berlin in uh, 1952. And so he started staging plays in Hindi um, using Brecht. Um, in Mumbai, there was... Uh, theater director Shanta Gandhi. She also became uh, an enthusiast for Brecht uh, because she said what she found in Brecht was that, you know, um, a link to the kind of roots of the soil that Brecht allowed her um, to make a connection to the soil. Now, the attraction to Brecht uh, expressed this search by playwrights, directors, and critics for forms that would engage with Indian theatrical traditions, particularly folk theater, in which music and poetry were important, and in which stories were also nonlinear. And Brecht allowed them to do that. Uh, <clears throat> of course, there were you know, people among the, these sort of theater professions who were making standard cultural nationalist argument, which was, you know, India had the three millennia tradition of uh, theater. Why did we, why do we need all this? You know, the only thing is to go back. Uh, so there were those people as well. Uh, but <clears throat> this kind of a modernist uh, element in uh, theater was the the dominant one and very important. Uh, uh, and these people were making kind of a, you know really nuanced uh, engagements with even questions of cultural heritage. There were, for example, a director called Panikar uh, in Southwest India, Kerala, uh, who used old Sanskrit drama 
uh, it's and regional music and ritual and martial arts form to create a kind of a modern idiom uh, for theater. The, the idea was to bring sort of modern sensibility to traditional forms. So there was a lot of kind of experimentation that was going on over here. Uh, there were playwrights in different Indian languages, in Hindi, in Kannada, in Marathi, uh, who evoked the past not to assert some essential unbroken sort of tradition. Uh, instead, they scrutinized traditions uh, in the context of modern concerns with equality, democracy, and so on. Okay. Um, I want to use one example of a play uh, in Hindi by um, a playwright called Dharamvir Bharti, who wrote a play called Andha Yug, which means the blind age, which was set in the time of antiquity during the last day of the war depicted in the Indian epic Mahabharata. Okay. The epic Mahabharata talks about this sort of you know, battle between uh, cousins or families of two cousins who are fighting over you know, their kingdom. Uh, and it's, it's a well-known um, epic that was used actually by cultural nationalists in the 19th and 20th century to depict India's struggle against the British in those terms. Okay. What uh, Bharti did in his play was to take that um, depiction of the war between um, cousins and turn it into a kind of a cautionary tale for the new nation. Uh, so for him, uh, whereas in the epic you have you know, this battle between uh, two sets of cousins and the victory of one set is celebrated. Uh, what Bharti did in his play was to depict India's uh, independence and partition together and say, if you think that the victory should be celebrated, remember that that victory also brought partition. It also brought slaughter. It also brought displacement. Um, and so he turned um, this play into kind of allegory of India's independence, uh, and that the time of victory were the time of grief and trauma. Uh, <clears throat> so this play and, uh, was staged again in uh, the old fort. And you can then imagine you know, the philosophical sweep of uh, the play was somehow captured by the stagecraft and the setting in the in the old fort. Uh, <clears throat> by 1974, uh, several plays in many different Indian languages uh, were kind of registering the social and political turmoil um, in the country. Um, there were plays by, you would know this, uh, Vijay Tendulkar in Marathi, Mohan Rakesh, Padal Sarkar, there were many, many plays. Uh, but I want to use one example of uh, a playwright called Girish Karnad, who wrote a play called Tughlaq. Uh, this is Girish Karnad. Uh, Karnad, uh, he he wrote his actually first play, and his first play was staged when he was 21. Absolute genius. Uh, and he wrote his play in Kannada. Uh, <clears throat> and his play, uh, Tughlaq, which was staged again in the Old Fort uh, in 1972, it was about a 14th century uh, Muslim king in India, who is ruling over Hindus. And 
the, the crux of the play is that here is a well-meaning king who is ruling over Hindus and he tries various measures for their benefit but all ends in chaos. It was an actually allegory on Nehru, that Nehru was ruling, ruling India and he had all these good intentions, but it resulted in kind of chaos. Uh, <clears throat> this was, you know, by the late 60s and early 70s, there was this kind of um, racket, radicalism in the air. I mean, and this is global. It's not particular to India. I mean, you know, this is the time of, you know, 1968 and, you know, uh, Everywhere, there is this kind of, a, you know, rebellion is in the air. Um, <clears throat> in in India, for example, uh, there's a playwright called Badal Sarkar who th who starts something called the Third Theatre, um, and the Third Theatre was to be a kind of a new form of radical theatre uh, that would break down the distance between. Uh, the actors and the audience between urban and rural and, you know, the play would sort of take over uh, society. This is also the time uh, of what is called alternative cinema uh, in India, which again uses this kind of a documentary forms and uh, produces kind of political films on political issues. And it also draws on the traditions of Cinema Novo from Brazil and Latin America, um, where again you have this use of uh, documentary forms to do kind of a neo-realist um, cinema. So, and you, I can tell the similar kind of story in Indian painting in the 70s as well. So you have um, in, in the 70s, a kind of souring of the old kind of post-colonial dream and a souring, a kind of a disillusionment with decolonization and search for new kinds of forms. Okay. Amal Alana, she is actually Alkazi's daughter, uh, but also um, uh, a theater director and a theorist uh, in her own right. And, in an article, you know, she writes about um, theater in the early 70s, and she says that you know, uh, what was particular about theater in the early 70s was that all these playwrights had become very conscious of their kind of third world location. Uh, and the characters in their plays uh, were no longer universal characters, but were now very local, uh, and they were very distinguished by their class location, uh, by their language, and so on. Uh, so one can say that in a way, in, by the early 70s, the challenge of creating a, a national culture, as seen by the state, uh, had been met. That they had tried to, they had and successfully created a, a kind of a, you know, modern idiom for traditional theater. They had been able to incorporate uh, traditional forms in modern theater. And this is particularly the case when uh, this uh, director called Karanth uh, on the left, he takes over NSD in 1977 and over the next five years, he really revolutionizes NSD in terms of number of productions. Um, and he himself is a very interesting character who was uh, trained in, um, in Kannada uh, theater, and then he learned Hindi, um, and he studied theater and music, and, you know, and really became uh, the director of NSD. And he opened NSD to lots of folk forms, classical music, choreography, cross-cultural performances. Um, people who studied under uh, Karanth remember that time as a time of great kind of experimentation. You know, and things were kind of sort of wild. 
1979, for example, he produced uh, Macbeth uh, in NSD, and it used uh, a, a sort of a Kannada theater form called Yakshagana, which has these kind of you know really flamboyant, colorful kind of characters. You know. uh, so he was producing something that was uh, alien both to the classic Elizabethan tradition, uh, but also to Indian languages. Okay. So you could say that you know by the end of his reign, by the 1980s, um, India had successfully created something called a modern national theater. Okay. And in, in fact, in 1989, the NSD or SNA uh, celebrated 100 years of Nehru's birth. And over 15 days, uh, they produced plays by major Indian playwrights and a kind of a, a national canon uh, was created. So, great success story, okay, on the one hand. However, it was a profoundly culturalist project. When Fanon and Cabral um, had talked about national culture, they had in mind a politically grounded and a, uh, and a kind of a dynamic process where culture would Con uh, continually evolve from political struggles. Okay. This was also uh, Ipta's vision of uh, a theater and culture being produced by struggles. It may have been didactic, it may have been propagandist, but at least the vision was that culture would be something that would be constantly, you know, ever changing and dynamic and created by political struggles. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the project of national culture that the state um, created had no link to that politics. It had no link to political struggle. Okay. Um, so even outside you know, uh, kind of state project, even outside theater professionals, you know, they were uh, engaged in all kinds of experimentation, uh, but it was not about politics. It was about how to evolve new kind of aesthetic forms, okay? new modern idioms for traditional culture. Okay? Uh, there is uh, an attempt uh, uh, in the 80s of a kind of a street theater. Um, and there was this man called Safdar uh, Hashmi, who was actually murdered in 1989, um, <clears throat> who, who tried to create this kind of th street theater, and the theater would be staged outside factory gates and so on. But again, it was you know urban intellectuals uh, taking up the theater to factory rather than being generated by the factory workers uh, themselves. Uh, <clears throat> so the point I want to stress in the end is that, that the state had captured the idea of national culture and made it into a culturalist project unrelated to political struggle. Culture after empire just became culture of the nation. And the state provided an important ground for the debate and discussion of what constituted national culture, what was an Indian aesthetic, how modern idioms could be developed for traditional cultural practices. But this was a debate that was disconnected from active democratic struggles of caste, class, gender. Uh, and it left this whole project open to other kinds of proponents of national culture. So it was only a matter of time that the Hindu nationalists would come and say, mm -hmm, not national enough. Uh, you have to make it more national. Okay. And how do you make it more national? Well, you make it more Hindu. Okay. Uh, 
And so when that happens, in fact, when I was doing this research uh, in Delhi and I was uh, meeting people at NSD, uh, at NSD they were constantly engaged in various meetings. And so I finally said, you know, why are you having so many meetings? He said that constantly we're trying to ward off one attempt or another by the government to turn NSD into really kind of a Hindu culture ministry. Uh, so they're fighting this kind of a battle, you know, to preserve what they think is kind of, you know, really a professional theater. So the theater professionals who had s expended so much effort in developing this modern idiom for Indian theater, um, they have now become a kind of a beleaguered minority who are constantly under siege by Hindu nationalists uh, who see NSD and who see this theater as um, not national enough. Uh, and these intellectuals are now often called anti-national. Sorry to end on this depressing note, but thank you. You know, when I was asked to, you know, as uh, Ludga says, I volunteered to respond to Gyan. That is, maybe that is the case, but I didn't know what I was volunteering into. <laughs> that is, you know, Gyan is somebody I had not met, although I had known Gyan because he's part of the subaltern collective. Some of you know about subaltern historiography. I know all his colleagues who are like Dipesh Chakravarti, Partha Chatterjee, Gayatri Spivak, whether she's part of it or not, you know, they've got all the debate. But there's a sense in which, you know, that is a subaltern group is seen as a Bengal-based, Calcutta-based kind of a phenomena. And then when I was following Gyan from a distance, you know, he wrote a book called Mumbai Fables. And I said, what is a subaltern doing writing books about Mumbai? You know, because they write about Bengali high culture or low culture or, you know, subaltern culture. Then I discovered he's not a Bengali, that he's actually a Bihari. And maybe as a Bihari, he's trying to create a distance between himself and the Bengali subalt uh, you know, subaltern studies by focusing on Bengal, uh, you know, on Mumbai. And Mumbai it is about what he also called urban noir, so he's concerned about a kind of a culture that is associated with Mumbai. And it's not only, I mean, in that book, he's talking about films, he's talking about smuggling, he's talking about street, and so on and so forth. It is a very much a kind of a subaltern in the sense it talks about a mass popular kind of a project that associated is Mumbai. And I say all these things because I'm from Mumbai, right? And I'm not only from Mumbai, I'm from a group of academics in Mumbai who came, all came out of Elphinstone College, which is Arjuna Padurai, Akhil Bilgrami, Homi Baba, and myself. And we, unlike the Bengali, you know, the kind of intellectual tradition, which is bilingual, they have a deep knowledge of both English and Bengali literature. Whereas in Mumbai, which is a very hybrid place with many, many languages, where lingua franca is English, because Arjun and me, or me and Homi or Akhil, we could never speak in our mother tongues. We could only speak in English. And most of us were very distant from our own languages. Many of them couldn't even write it because they all went to the English language school. I'm one of the few people who knew my own mother tongue, but I had turned my back on Eng my mother tongue, which is Kannada, which is the language of Karnad and all he was talking about, Karanth and all. Uh, because I went into an English medium college and I had to succeed and so on, I turned my back, right? So this is a kind of a context about what Mumbai represents in a particular way. So you have to get a sense of the Mumbai he's talking about. And there are two kind of Mumbai he's talking about. 
you know, in his presentation, you will notice there are three historical periods. One is from 1945 to about 1955, which is the Ipta period, which is where a Pannonian possibility of a national culture, which is cosmopolitan, which is not nationalistic, but which is cosmopolitan, not in the modern sense of the word, but in the sense it is open to different kind of a possibility rather than being confined by the project of national sovereignty and so on. And that is the kind of a project he's exploring when he talks about the Ipta and group, Mulukan, Rajanand, and so on. And that is the period which you will see it sort of a comes to, as he, according to his narration account, around 55, it is beginning to fade. And one of the most important questions he asks is, why did it fade? And gives an explanation. And then he talks about the next phase, which is about 1955 to about 1975, maybe into eight, early, late, early 80s, which is a kind of a project where instead of the Safanonian national culture, you have, we don't have the kind of a nationalist majoritarian culture, but you've got a, a kind of you know, interval, an interim kind of a place where state takes over the cultural project of the national culture. What, I mean, he didn't use the word secular, but you know, secular is, with Nehru, there's a whole secular project of culture as he talks about, about the national drama theater, which was multilingual and so on and so forth. The, the figure here becomes Al-Khazi, the, the, the Arab-born the director who lived a very long life and had a huge impact. And as you will notice when um, Jan said, it is unimaginable that we would have somebody like heading the national theater. So that is a particular kind of a period which, which would be seen as a kind of a secular age in which Nehru's shadow dominated that period. And, and I think Jan asked a very important question about why the Ipta kind of a thing faded out and it was taken over by the state. And you'll see there was a picture, photograph he showed about Ipta and the kind of a thing where there's a vast majority of people in 1948 or at some meeting, right? You showed a picture. That was an amazing kind of a picture where you had a kind of a potential of a resonance between the theater project or art and culture project and the people. And then if you, as you go through all the visual presentations he gave, including the theater, of course, in a theater there's not going to be a lot of people because it's on the theater, but basically the connection with the people as such seemed to have been severed as the nationalist project started. Although there were lots of plays, a lot of people were involved across this thing. This is a question I would like to ask you on this point, right? You know, there was a theater, there was, you know, the, the, the project of the state was not just theater. There was a massive investment into film, the alternative cinema you talked about. And there was, uh, there was a huge propaganda machine in terms of the broadcasting, making documentaries and things like that. But if we think about the alternative cinema, which had a whole series of people, you know, and they were all funded by the state. You know, the, lots of their films were entirely funded by the state. It was not like little here and things like that. A lot of the theater which you're talking about became funded by the state. So as Gyan said, in some way, the state hijacked the project or took over with good intentions in many ways. And then the, his, the end story is basically, according to Gyan, they create a successful national theater, if you focus only on theater, with new aesthetic forms which would be not borrowed from the West, which will sort of, you know, imaginatively connect with the, you know, with the, um, with the, uh, the indigenous or the traditional form, but refunction it and so on and so forth. So, Jan's account, it was a successful project, but it was now no longer connected to the kind of ifta kind of a project. It was no longer Fanonian, although it may have served. And then we have the how it may have set the stage for takeover by the 
BJP and the kind of nationalist kind of thing because it was already under the, in some way, you know, structurally, institutionally, it had become statist project, right? And here I want to add, this is the ironic part of the, my comment is, when he begins to talk, that is, when uh, uh, Jan begins to talk about the project of 1955 to 1975, and you might think I'm being narcissistic, and I don't want you to think you are nice narcissistic. I came to Mumbai in 1956, you know, and I left Mumbai in 1968 to come and study theater at Tufts University. And for about three years, 1965 to 1968, I was running a theater, you know, Anglophone theater, doing directing plays like Endgame by Samuel Beckett, Zoo Story. My actors were like Arjuna Padurai and so on and so forth. It was a very strange kind of a phenomena. And what I remember at that period in time, you see, this is the, I am a very good informant for Gyan, if he went, you know, want to go on. You know, I knew all these people, Girish Karnad, Sham Benegal, all these people were the people with whom I hung around. There was next, right next to, next to uh, Elphinstone College, where I was directing all these plays, and you know, Arjun was a freshman, I was a graduate student, we were doing plays. He was playing Zoo Story. There was a restaurant called Samovar, which is a sort of a Russian, you know, it was a tea place. And all the painters, artists, and all used to hang around. What I'm trying to get to you is the scale. That is, what I want to impress upon you, and I want you to sort of think about this also, is the scale was incredibly small. It was a very narrow group of people, small group of people. I want to anecdotally t talk, tell you about it, is that when I did the play Endgame, the makeup person was a person called Sham Benegal who went on to become a major filmmaker. And the lighting person was called Mahajan who went on to become a major filmographer. And the person who designed covers, as, as you know, Gyan was saying, the people who designed cover for al Qazi's plays when he was in, Belga, uh, in, in Mumbai, were people like Hussein, who became a huge you know, painter. And the person who designed my cover was Guy Thunde, who is a major figure. And once I was telling my son about how these were the three people who were involved, my son with great thing, he says, so dad, what happened to you? <laughs> I mean, you know, only a son can tell you, right? You know? You failed, right? So what, what I'm trying to get you is the world was incredibly small. It was very elitist from a one point of view. And, and there was also the element of what you see, the, 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 the kind of a New York, um, the, the, uh, the TV series, Mad Men. There were a lot of these people who were involved in film were advertising people. That's the way they could make a living. You know, Sham Benegal was an advertising person. You know, you know, there was a whole range of people. So when you begin to look at that world, it was partly the fact, as, as uh, Gyan is trying to say, is about how they became severed or as they created a very interesting aesthetic form. Became, but they got severed by the, from the people. It is not that they became severed politically in some sense but they were already entering into a, a world which was very much a narrowly focused world. They were all from upper classes, English-speaking elite, had gone to kind of thing. See, this is what was, and at the same time, there was a Marathi theater, is a local theater, which was far more, far more different, which, had, which, could, which could actually commercially earn its keep. Whereas our theater was completely, when I started my theater, I started with, what, about $150 by three donors. So it was a very small scale. You could do all these things. You had a very small group of audience, and you would sort of get acknowledgment and recognition and all within that circle. And al Qazi had just left. So it was a kind of a world. Bombay had a vacuum because al Qazi had left. Alik Padamsi was the 
his brother-in-law, I think, was he his brother-in-law? He was, he was sort of, a, he was running it. So in a way, it was a place world, you, you know, if Padamsi recognizes it, you become a part of it. So I don't know how long that world was, but as I keep going back to the India, that world began to expand, the cultural world, expand in terms of larger and larger numbers. So the question of scale, what you have today, whether BJP controls it or not, the culture industry of this kind of a level is huge. Is a massive thing. In the same way, if, if you think about a game of cricket, used to everybody knows used to know all the cricket players. Now it is so huge and money and so on and so forth. So it's a different world about it. Not just BJP has hijacked it, but the cultural industry is a very different kind of a thing. So in a way, it's going to be a very interesting project here. You know what? You know what Gyan is trying to do is when? How did we go from? 45 to 55, 55 to 75, and where are we now? So because he's done already the book, you know, the, the fables, which is much more a people's project, this is a very much an elite project, and, you know, it ultimately it might be a question about why elite failed. I don't know. That, I'll stop at that. Yeah, I mean, certainly the question of uh, <coughs> scale is important. Uh, but I think what happens is in this kind of separation between, let's say, the Ipta period and subsequently, is that culture as an institution, I mean, one, one thinks of culture as an institution, what happens to culture as an institution when it is primarily a kind of a culturalist project. Then, obviously, it attracts, you know, a small group of intellectuals. I mean, these are people, you know, who are, yeah, I mean, these are people you like, you know, they're, <laughs> yeah, they're artists and, you know, they're writers and, uh, you know, they're very interesting and, you know, you hang out with them and they are doing really interesting creative things. And many of them are also, you know, in their kind of politics, very, you know, radical. So take the example of Girish Karnad, you know, who is not himself political, but, you know, in, uh, just before he died, he, he was in uh, very bad health. I know. And Too much he came with his sort of oxygen tank to a protest meeting against the BJP because he saw what the BJP was doing to culture. But, you know, throughout his life, he was not really connected to politics in any way. I mean, he studied, you know, in Dharwad, as you know. Uh, he was fixated on getting Rhodes Scholarship. He got Rhodes, he went to Oxford, got his degree there, came back and worked for Oxford University Press for a while, did plays, and then, you know, but he, but he continued writing plays in Kannada. Okay? But he was not connected to any political movement. So, I mean, I think the the lack of scale has to do with the fact that the institution of culture uh, became severed from politics itself. Okay. Uh, and it became purely uh, uh, a realm of culture. Um, and in any case, theater is always small scale. Yeah, very small scale. Yeah. Uh, so now when you think of, you know, National School of Drama and so on, yeah, they, they loom large in terms of their kind of importance and publicity, but in terms of scale, it's, it's really small. And of course, then what happens in the 80s, uh, which is, of course, part of the story, is the huge expansion of cinema industry and television. Uh, and so the culture industry now becomes, within the culture industry, theater becomes even more limited, you know, more narrowly focused on some people who appreciate it. Most people now are you know, watching TV and you know, cinema and so on. So, so th that you know, transformation in the culture industry is also kind of relevant. I think we should open it up. The yeah. question is also you know, whether the scale makes cooptation easier. Yeah. Anyway, we're opening it up to the... Yeah, go ahead. 
Thank you. This was very interesting. I, as I told you before, I really don't know anything about it, though I feel I have quite a lot of experience as a child. I grew up in Bulgaria, so I've seen a lot of Indian films, but obviously no Indian theater. Now, the way I understand it, the story you're telling is that what happened with national culture that turned nationalist is that this IFTA project was brought to an end because the state co-opted it. Isn't it possible that part of the reason of this development is that there was something already in the IFTA project itself, that there was a conflict between the way that on the one hand you see national cultures being experimental and doing something new, but at the same time, if you want to be radically new, somehow this stands in conflict with going back to nationalist traditions and so on. You're not radically new if you go back, however much you reinterpret these nationalist traditions in a new way. Now, as I said, I don't really know anything about Indian theater, but I was just thinking from your description that this Fanonian way of looking at culture doesn't quite sit very comfortably with an idea that you build national culture by going back to traditional cultural values, especially in a country where you have so many uh, national languages, and that obviously plays a role in theater. So. No, thank you for your question. But you know, uh, I'm thinking of one example uh, in, in Mumbai, for example. Uh, when IPTA was active in the mill district, uh, they had a um, few performers who had actually risen from the ranks of the mill workers themselves. They worked in textile mills. Uh, but they managed to incorporate a very traditional form of Marathi tamasha, tamasha. Um, into a new form of theater. Now, traditional uh, Tamasha theater is a very kind of a body kind of a theater. It's full of, I don't know, vulgarity, and you know, it uses vulgarity and shock and so on, uh, and highly sort of gendered. What he does, I mean, what these two people did, they took that form and placed in a completely modern context of you know, fight between capitalists and workers and so on. So it was possible. I mean, I think, you know, there was nothing intrinsically uh, reactionary about trying to, you know, draw on traditions and finding a modern idiom for it. I think what I find what happens and which is important is that that project becomes a kind of a state project. Uh, and it becomes disconnected from the IPTA kind of, you know, attempt to build culture. Uh, I mean, just, I, I can kind of personal experience. So m my father, he was very interested in culture. He was actually by profession a lawyer, uh, but he became, uh, in charge of IPTA um, in the 70s in our hometown. By this time, IPTA actually had very little presence among the working class and so on. So, so all of us from the family, my sister, my brother, we became kind of IPTA people. Now, we were not from the working class, <laughs> uh, but we went to working class areas, yeah, I mean, trying to tell them how to be wor a worker, you know, through our songs, through our plays, and so on. I mean, when, when I, I mean, I enjoyed it hugely when I was doing it, but when I think about it now, I, I can see how ridiculous it was, you know. Um, so, I mean, I think that was because that connection had been snapped. Uh, thank you so much for a fascinating talk, and uh, it inspired me in, in many ways to think about culture and, and politics. Um, I would like to uh, make a little bridge between what uh, what you were talking about and uh, 
political and cultural space in which we are <laughs> sitting, which is uh, Austria, which used to be an empire too, and a uh, couple of neighboring park, uh, countries, which used to be until not so, uh, not such a long time ago, part of a, you can say, Soviet empire. And um, I feel that, um, of course, this is painting with a very wide brush, but I feel that culture has not been a particularly uh, experimental space for thinking about politics after empire in these, in these countries, um, very much caught in the discourse of, of catching up with the West uh, when it comes to Eastern Europe or some mix of uh, nationalism, isolationist culture and so forth. As I said, this is very <laughs> general reading, of course, of the situation. And so my question is, um, how do you think, based on your research, that we can cultivate culture as a space for political imagination, uh, let's say more rad radical political imagination? How do we contribute to culture as a space for these um, intellectual political imaginations? Thank you. You know, I can only think of certain examples. Uh, so, for example, uh, there was this farmers' movement uh, in India uh, a year or two ago. And then there was also, before that, uh, a movement against the present government's attempt to uh, really make Indian citizenship based on religion. They passed an amendment. I happened to be in Delhi, and I went to this area where the movement was actually led by women. Many of them older women, and many of them women who had never been you know, involved in politics. Never. You know, what happens in, in many situations when you go uh, in India, if I go from an art event to a political event to an academic event, uh, the people remain more or less the same. <laughs> They're the same people, you know, who go to these. But this was different. This was these, uh, and I kid you not, I mean, there were, you know, women ranging from 16-year-old to 80-year-old who were sitting all day in this kind of protest. Now, it also created its own form of art. Uh, so, it, now it was not a, a separate project, but I think the politics created, you know, the expression of their ideas, created new forms of, for example, poster art, new forms of music, new forms of dance. So, uh, I mean, I think politics creates uh, its for, as form of its expression uh, art. And so, you know, if one thinks of, let's say, what's going on in, in Ukraine and so on, I mean, I would imagine that that is also producing certain forms of art and artistic expressions. It's a question of sort of just mobilizing that. I think we're going to take two questions. I think you might want to take both the questions together so that... All right, this is sort of a question and a half because you sort of answered my question. I was wondering if there are any examples of successful implementation of Prince Fanon's, Fanon's uh, vision uh, outside of India that you can think of. And you sort of answered that already. The second question was Benedict Anderson's idea that uh, uh, communities of imagination and that the nation state depends on creating a culture to create the idea of that. And how does that relate to what happened in India? What's happening in India? Yeah. Sorry, my question is rather naive. This is just my feeling. Doesn't class play a part? Because what I notice is middle classes generally take over anything. It could start for, say, working classes, but once these people get involved, we just hijack the whole thing be that be scholarships to schools or anything else. Mm -hmm. So why should the art be any different? Is that your feeling as well when you were looking at the data, or is this just prejudice in my mind? Mm. Sorry, thank you. Um, well, let me start with, uh, with you. Um, 
Um, so what did the second question was remind me? Of? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yes, I mean, nationalism creates its own, you know, so culture of, you know, martyrdom, heroes, print culture. I mean, I think of Gandhi. Uh, he creates the whole kind of a new national dress through homespun cloth, you know. Um, so, yes, it, it does. And, and I, I think, you know, um, um, even these kind of um, radical groups like uh, IPTA in the 40s and 50s, they tried to create an alternative forms of culture. So, for example, if you think of many of these households in the 40s and the 50s, uh, there's an, a kind of a portrait culture that develops where you have, in many of these households, what are the pictures? You have a picture of Marx, you have a picture of Lenin, you have a picture of Ho Chi Minh, you have a picture of uh, Patrice Lumumba, uh, Che Guevara. So, so there is a, you know, a, a kind of a radical portrait culture that uh, sort of develops out of this. It's never able to you know, match the strength of the uh, nationalist culture of you know, 20s and 30s. There are attempts. So, I mean, you can see that, uh, you know, one of the things with um, Anderson is that Anderson thinks that uh, only nationalism can create uh, this kind of cultural affiliation where you are willing to die for the nation, you're willing to die for the flag. Um, but I think there is an attempt by, you know, these sort of radical groups. Uh, for example, the exaltation of Ho Chi Minh uh, or Che Guevara is that these are people who, you know, died for their cause. So there is a kind of an attempt to create, create that. Perhaps it doesn't match that kind of strength. Um, the middle class, you know, many of these activists, they belong to the middle class, you know. Um, I mean, I remember even about Che Guevara. I mean, the, uh, Che Guevara belongs to a relatively wealthy class. And it's his confrontation with poverty which, you know, moves him and turns him into a revolutionary. So it happens to many of these uh, people too uh, who are who belong to the middle class and want to, you know, work for, you know, a kind of radical uh, future and for the working class. The problem is not so much that they belong to this, uh, the middle class. It is that culture as a realm uh, becomes separated from this. You can see some, you know, changes now. For example, when the farmers' movement broke out in India in the, uh, last year, they cr uh, the farmers' movement created just uh, an amazing ra range of uh, cultural experiments, uh, and it brought together both middle class but also farmers. And the farmers were uh, then involved in creating new kinds of posters and so on. So. I mean, I, I don't think so much the question is so much of class origin. It's just how does culture and politics, you know, as different institutions uh, uh, interact. There's one more question, or should we take? Okay, go ahead. I'm not quite sure that the, uh, I understand that you are saying that the, uh, there was a disconnect at a certain point uh, between uh, theater and politics. But is it really true? I mean, can we make a different argument there? I mean, can you, I'm sure you, we can see uh, or we can find examples of political theater uh, even today. But I think the scale and the significance uh, of this uh, may be very different because uh, the historical period uh, that you are talking about uh, there was uh, there was a space 
of national culture, uh, which then was filled in uh, by, uh, by the kind of political theater uh, that you are describing. And then uh, what happens, you can, you can also play the devil's advocate and say that, uh, that we see uh, a commercialization and massification, and uh, we, you can even see a democratization of theater uh, and to some extent, and we still have political theater, but it occupies a very different uh, space there. So we see, uh, if you like, a fragmentation of uh, also public sphere uh, uh, here, and what, what was really a defining feature of this uh, period was the fact that, uh, uh, that it, it was uh, alternative theater financed by the state. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and the state has a different uh, project right now. And why was it financed by the state? Because that's what there was. Uh, at the time, and that you know, filled in the space that there was. Yeah, what I mean, you say about it, <laughs> I mean uh, you know, um, Dilip was mentioning the NFDC, National Finance Film Development Corporation, for example. They financed many of these kind of alternative films. Uh, so, you know, it. I don't think the sort of question so much is that the entry of the state changes the content of culture itself. It's that uh, it becomes a state project and culture gets separated from politics. And so you do have, you know, very radical uh, theater people who are producing really political theater. And even today, so, for example, you know, these people who did uh, street theater, uh, both in its form and also in its content, uh, they were very, you know, politically edgy. So, the question was not that, you know, the state's entry changes the content of the theater itself. It's that the theater as an institution gets separated from politics. I, I think that point you should take in the sense there was a friend of mine called Kumar Shahani who was a major alternative filmmaker and he made nine films and many of them highly critical of the state and statist project and none of them were ever released. So you can have all the radical content but have virtually no exhibition. That is, he, he would win a couple of awards but it had no connection to anybody seeing that beyond and when the television came, sometimes th those were aired at different times, but uh, you don't have any idea how many people ever saw these films. So that is the kind of, that is the real problem about the, uh, but I think what um, Jan is saying, which hopefully tomorrow you'll come, is, a, is about how politics can create culture. In fact, tomorrow Muklika Banerjee and a couple of other people are talking about how the farmers movement is talking about how in, ad in addition to creating new forms of solidarity, it creates actually new forms of solidarity by way of aesthetic practices and art and so on and so forth. So that would be an interesting thing for you to observe. And uh, she's got, I mean, the, both of them are going to talk about the, the phenomenology of the art production itself during the political protest. So shall we close with that? Yeah, yeah but, I, I, but I do want to say that, you know, the question of the transformation of the public sphere is an important one. Uh, that uh, how the public sphere then becomes uh, dominated by a new kind of, you know, culture industry. Um, where, you know, theater, for example, plays a very smaller part and television and so on and so forth become very important. So, that's... Um, people talk about kind of different kinds of publics now. Uh, with the um, public sphere, the transformation public sphere, and that's part of the story. Yeah. With that, let's give a great hand to Jan. Thank you so much. We're going for a wine and cheese, is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs>